that you have to turn on your camera and turn off your microphone. Uh, please behave during the virtual lecture. So I hope our students not allowed to leave before this room, before the section is over. Question can be asked by chat menu, or maybe you can directly uh, to Professor Jane. And in the middle of discussion, you can interrupt the information from Professor Jane. You will have the opportunity to submit text question to Professor Jane by typing your question into the column menu or you may send in your question at any time during the presentation and I will collect this and address them at the end of the presentation. And then in the end of virtual lecture, it will be informed the URL of the A-certificate so you don't leave the Zoom. And the, for the students, you have to make a resume for today's lecture because the resume can uh, for your certificate. The link is only active for 60 minutes. This is a curriculum vitae. The Honorable, our lecture, Professor Jane C. D. Chow, PhD from College of Nutrition, Taipei Medical University, Taiwan. We would like to welcome in virtual lecture, Nutrition in life cycle about nutrition assessment for elderly. Special gratitude for the lecture from Universitas Negeri Medan, Miss Nila. I hope she joined with us. And of course, to all students in Nutrition Universitas Negeri Semarang and Universitas Negeri Medan. I'm Natalia Desi Putriing Tias. It is, it is a great pleasure to participate in this virtual lecture with Professor Jen and of course for hearing the powerful idea from her. Before we get started, um, I will introduce Professor Jen, CZ Chow, PhD. She's going to talk about nutrition assessment for elderly. She is a dean of nutrition department, School of Nutrition and Health Sciences, Taipei Medical University. Educational background from Ohio State University, US for PhD in the major human nutrition and food management. This is the research project, biostatistic application of Chinese herb cocktail on the prevention and therapy of chronic disease and evaluation of functional food. Publication, so many publication including people with suspect COVID-19 symptom. Uh, and we can read comparison of nutritional risk screening tools for the elderly. Okay, Professor Jane. Yes, uh, yes. You can, the screen is yours. I will stop. So can I just... Yeah. Yes. Can I start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can start. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jane Chow from uh, College of Nutrition, uh, Taipei Medical <laughs> University. Good to see you online, everybody. My topic today is nutritional assessment and status analysis in the elderly. I will go through uh, those topics today. So the learning objectives are nutritional screening and instrument. Also, we'll introduce uh, the categories of nutritional assessment. And finally, I will introduce establishment of a nutritional assessment tool. So those are the references. So first of all, I would like to briefly introduce nutritional screening and instrument. 
So, uh, what's the purpose for screening, uh, especially for the elderly? So, usually, we'll think about uh, the purpose of screening is fast. So, that means um, we will use a simple uh, instrument or simple tool or simple uh, device to uh, screen or identify whether the people have malnutrition in a short period of time. Therefore, uh, when we uh, choose appropriate screening uh, nutritional think about Um, whether it's suitable or appropriate for the population we want to uh, screen. And for the elderly, because sometimes they cannot understand or they cannot listen very well or they cannot read uh, very well. So usually when you use the questionnaire, you have to uh, minimize the number of the question as minimal as possible. And also we want to like to screen um, nutritional status. We we'll think about what's the problem of the elderly. For example, the elderly often occurs anemia, hyperlipidemia, or some other chronic diseases, for example, diabetes. And they do have some, uh, sometimes have uh, electrolyte disturbances. For example, calcium, potassium, sodium um, imbalance. When you know the problems the elderly have, you have uh, focus on, on those problems and think how uh, they can affect, this problem can affect their nutritional status. Therefore, there's a several instruments I will introduce later. Uh, the first one is determining your nutritional health. That's the uh, title of the questionnaire. So it's already described the purpose of the questionnaire as nutritional health. So after the uh, questionnaire, after filling the questionnaire, uh, they will have the total score according to the total score, we can uh, divide it into different categories. I will talk this later. The second instrument is nutritional risk index, abbreviated NRI. Nutritional risk index is also a questionnaire. So um, after the, uh, filling the questionnaire, we can also add the sum of the total score. So according to the total score, uh, we can divide it into different categories. Geriatric Nutritional Risk Index, abbreviated as GNRI. You can see uh, this uh, nutritional risk index is different from, uh, I just talked about uh, uh, previously nutritional risk index. This one is especially for the elderly. So you can see the title of the uh, nutritional risk index is geriatric. Geriatrics means elderly. So this uh, nutritional risk index is specially designed for the elderly. But this uh, instrument is different from the instruments I just mentioned above. This one is a formula. So we can calculate according to the formula. There are three uh, very important parameters uh, in the formula. So I will talk these parameters later. One of the parameters is albumin concentration. Therefore, the elderly should uh, have the, their blood drawn to test uh, albumin concentration. It's a biochemical parameter. The final instrument is mini nutritional assessment, abbreviated MNA. It's you can see the mini, that means uh, the questions are not too long. And the question, the number of the questions are not too many. So we'll call mini. And this uh, instrument uh, is a questionnaire 
and also is very, very common used in the world because uh, it is already translated into different languages. So can be used in different countries. First of all, I would uh, introduce determine your nutritional health. This um, questionnaire was begun in 1990 and several organizations developed determining your nutritional health, including American Academy of Family Physicians, American Dietetics Association, and the National Council on the Aging. So those organizations develop determining your nutritional health. I will talk about uh, the content of the questionnaire later. But the final, they will give you uh, the total score. If the total score is equal to or greater than six, that means you probably at the risk of malnutrition. So you have to determine your nutritional health, this total question of 10. So only 10 questions. I just mentioned that the purpose of a screening tool should be fast, uh, nearly 100% of accuracy, but not uh, required to reach to 100% accuracy and also simple, especially for the elderly. The answer is also very simple. Uh, there's only two answer, yes, or no, so you can choose either or. If you choose yes, they will, uh, you will get a different score. The score range from one to four. So depending on how important of the question can affect uh, your nutritional status. So if you see if the uh, person say yes and gets four scores, that means this question is very, very important and also primarily can affect uh, your nutritional status. So we'll go through the question very quickly. Uh, the first question is, I have an illness or a condition uh, that made me change the kinds and or amounts of food I eat. Uh, yes, two points. I eat fewer than two meals per day. Yes, three points. I eat few fruits or vegetable or meal products. Yes, two points. I have three or more drinks of beer, liquor, or wine almost every day. Uh, yes, two points. I have two tooth or mouth problems that make it hard for me to eat. Two points. I don't always have enough money to buy the food I need. Four points. So you can see if no money does uh, directly affect uh, you can buy the food because uh, you you don't have the money to buy the food. And that's the four point. I eat alone most of the time. Sometimes in Taiwan, I, I also eat alone most of the time. <laughs> Say yes, one point. I take three or more, difficult, uh, more different prescribed or over-the-counter drugs a day. Yes, one point. Without wanting to, I have lost or gained 10 pounds in the last six months, two points. Finally, uh, the question is, I'm not always physically able to shop, cook, and or feed myself, two points. So you can see uh, there's only 10 questions and easy to answer. Even the elderly cannot speak. They can use, uh, they can knock um, the head or wave their head, uh, indicate yes or no. So it's very easy to answer. And uh, the number is, also is small from one to four and easy to uh, sum up. So you will get the uh, total score. So the 10 questions with a total score of 21 points. If the person gets um, zero to two points, that means you are at a good nutritional status. We check your nutritional score in six months. So that will tell, tell us even you are at a good nutritional status. For the elderly, how long you have to check your nutritional status? Six months. So that means half year, you have to check your nutritional status. If you get uh, uh, three to five points, that means you are at moderate nutritional risk. See what can be done to improve your eating habits and uh, life cycle uh, and the lifestyle. And, 
you can work in uh, the organization in your country related to um, aging programs or senior programs uh, that they do have the professionals to help you to improve your nutritional status. If your score is equal to or more than six, that means you are at high nutritional risk. That means you probably at risk, high risk of malnutrition. So they suggest that you will bring this checklist that's determining your nutritional health checklist next time when you see your doctor or dietitian or other qualified health or social service professionals. Talk with them with about any problems you might have and ask for help to improve your nutritional status. So that's a determining your nutritional health. The next one, I will introduce nutritional risk index. Uh, this questionnaires was developed by uh, these two persons in 1993. And these questionnaires focuses on uh, mechanics of food intake, prescribed dietary, uh, dietary restric uh, uh, restriction. What is uh, prescribed dietary restrictions? If you know the answer, you can turn on your microphone and to answer my question. What is prescribed dietary restrictions? Does anybody want to answer my question or give some examples? What is prescribed dietary restrictions? For example, for hypertensive patients, what kind of the dietary restriction you will, uh, the dietitian or physician will prescribe to the patients, to hypertensive patients? How about low sodium diet? So for hypertensive patients, uh, dietitian or physicians will prescribe low sodium diet to hypertensive patients. This uh, low sodium diet we call prescribed dietary restrictions. For chronic uh, kidney disease patients, also uh, we can prescribe um, low protein diet. So this low protein diet is also is a uh, prescribed dietary restriction. The other uh, questions uh, are related to discomfort uh, associated with the food intake and significant changes in dietary habits, morbid conditions affecting food intake. For example, uh, if you do have the problem or patients have, or the elderly have the problem with oral intake, that means they probably uh, is difficult to uh, swallow or biting the food uh, in mouth, or uh, they do have the problem with their GI, uh, gastrointestinal tract. So uh, they don't eat the food uh, by oral intake. They probably uh, can have the food by tube feeding or other uh, routes. And this questionnaire uh, contains 16 questions. It's a, a little bit more than uh, 10 questions. We just talk about determining your nutritional health. And uh, the answer is also very easy um, as yes or no. So uh, the elderly can choose yes or no. If the person answers yes, that means you can get one point. So you can add up how many points or how many questions uh, you answer yes. If your points or your score uh, is equal to or greater than seven, that means you have at least seven questions you say yes. That means um, indicates you are at greater risk for poor nutritional status. So we can, uh, so, so we, don't, we don't go through the questions, but the question is very simple uh, and very similar with the determining your nutritional health. The third uh, uh, instrument is geriatric nutritional risk index. Uh, it was developed by uh, Bowen et al. in 2005. And this formula was published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And uh, you can see the formula here. So GNRI is equal to 1.489. Multiple, multiply albumin concentration uh, in grams per liter plus 
multiplied by your present body weight divided by uh, ideal body weight. So, so there's uh, three parameters, um, blood albumin concentration, your present body weight and ideal body weight. There's, uh, there's a two uh, different ideal body weight either for men and for women. So you can see that's the ideal body weight calculation formula. It's very difficult uh, if you want to uh, calculate GNRI if you don't have albumin concentration. So that's a little bit uh, difficult for the elderly uh, if you don't have this albumin uh, biochemical data. So usually if you want to have GNRI score, at least you will have uh, your albumin data. So you have to walk in or walk to the hospital, visit the hospital to get uh, albumin concentration. So uh, it's a little bit uh, hard for the elderly if they, they uh, do have something like limitation for their uh, mobility. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult for them to get uh, albumin concentration. However, if you have the uh, albumin concentration, you do know your present body weight, you can calculate uh, your ideal body weight, then you can calculate your GNRI score. There's uh, four categories after you have your GNRI score. The, uh, the first category is if the GNRI score is less than 82, that means uh, the person is at major risk of malnutrition. If the GNRI score is between 82 and less than 92, that means uh, you are at moderate risk of malnutrition. If the GNRI score is between 92 to 98, uh, indicates the person's had, uh, the, the, indicate the person uh, is at low risk of malnutrition. And finally, if the GNRI scores Greater than 98 indicates the person um, doesn't have uh, risk for malnutrition. So there's a four categories. Up to now, so we already introduced uh, three different instruments. So we can see the first two instruments are questionnaires and the third instrument is formula. But uh, however, if you uh, look at all the instruments I just uh, introduced right now, you can see even they have the questionnaire, the questions are simple and the answers are also very simple. And it's easy to get the final score. And also, uh, finally, you will have some like different categories. We do have uh, three to four categories right now. So you can see, uh, uh, sorry, two to four uh, different categories right now. Uh, for R NRI, just I talk about the uh, questionnaire before. NRI only have two categories. One is if, if your score is equal to or greater than seven, that means you are at a risk of malnutrition. If your score less than seven, that means you have no risk. So two categories. But for determining your nutritional health, we have uh, three categories. For a geriatric nutritional risk index, we have four categories. Okay. Finally, I will introduce the instrument is mini nutritional assessment, abbreviated MNA. This. Uh, questionnaire was developed by uh, these two persons in 1994 in France. And it was a validated screening and assessment tool for identifying geriatric patients at risk of malnutrition. So this questionnaire especially, particularly uh, designed for the elderly. And the purpose of this questionnaire is to uh, verify who is at risk of malnutrition. And they have two parts. The first part we call screening part. The second part we call assessment part. So the person should fill in the screening question first. 
and add uh, their scores. So they have the subtotal scores after they fill in the screening part. And if the person uh, get the score, need to go to the second part, they will go to the assessment part. If the person uh, the person scores is not required to go to the assessment part, so they can stop uh, in the screening part. That means they probably at good nutritional status. So they have two stages. The first stage is go to the screening part. The second stage is go to the assessment part. For the screening part, um, they have six questions. Um, out of the six questions, five questions are pure questions, and only one question is related to the measurement. It's a kind of an anthropometric measurement. The second part we call assessment part uh, contains 10 pure questions, plus two questions are related to the measurements, uh, also are anthropometric measurements. So this questionnaire contains a total of 18 questions. Uh, 15 questions are pure questions and three questions are related to anthropometric measurements. So it's a kind of the more complete um, questionnaire compared with the determine your nutritional health, nutritional risk index. So they are uh, a total of 18 questions. And finally, they were, uh, get the scores and have three categories, divided into three categories. The first category is malnourished. If the MNA scores less than 17 points. The second category is at risk for malnutrition. If the MNA score uh, is between 17 and 23.5 points. So you can see they have 0.5 uh, points. So I will talk about uh, the questionnaire later. And the third category is the well nourished. That means uh, you had good nutritional status. If the MNA score greater than 23.5 points. So uh, three categories. A little bit, the, the font size is a little bit small, but you can see uh, this is the MNA uh, questionnaire. So you can see in the upper right uh, corner, you can see nasty. So because it's uh, developed uh, in France and also uh, the copyrights belong to nasty. Uh, nasty company translate this original MNA languages into different languages so they can use uh, in uh, almost all over the world. So that's the reason why MNA is so popular right now for nutritional assessment, uh, not only for the elderly, but also for other populations. So uh, you can see the MNA form on the top of the form, they have the basic information of the persons. And you can see there's a two uh, parts of the uh, questionnaire. The first part is screening uh, questions. And the second part is assessment questions. So you can see the color of the background are different. For a screening part, uh, the color of background is kind of the light blue. But the, uh, for the assessment part, um, the background is white. So you can see uh, very clearly if you design uh, the questionnaire, um, the persons can very uh, clearly see uh, there's uh, two parts of the questionnaires. So uh, in the Western country, they usually use alphabetical order as more often than numbers. So you can see the question is uh, using A, B, C to number not to use the aerobic number. So you can see that's the A, B, C, D, E, F. If you see the question F uh, is the measurement part, this body mass index. So we'll describe 
uh, there's uh, four different scores from zero to three. So you can fill in your scores in this square. Then you can add the score from question A to question B, uh, sorry, to question F. So you will have the total uh, subtotal score here. So if the total subtotal score is between 12 to 14 points, that's you are at normal nutritional status. If uh, the score is uh, eight to 11 points, that means you are at risk of malnutrition or if the score is zero to seven points, that's malnourished. So if the scores is less than 12 points, you will go to assessment part. If the score is above, is equal to or above 12 points, you can uh, stop. So you can just have uh, the screening part. So depending on how much for your to uh, subtotal score. So if the total score less than 12, so we go to the uh, assessment part from question G to question R. If you see the question P, Q, R, those uh, three questions are, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Q, R, Q, R. Those two questions are measurements, anthropometric measurements. Q is mid arm circumference in centimeter. So you have to um, measure your mid arm circumference. R, question R is cup circumference. So you will uh, major uh, your, your, uh, the, between the leg uh, and your feet. So that's calf circumference, uh, also in centimeter. So there's a two measurements. You will feel your scores uh, in the square. So you can see some of the questions have 0.5 score. Uh, for example, question K and question P, question Q, those three questions have uh, the score is 0 0.5. So when you add the total score, uh, include the screening part and assessment part, so you can have the total score here uh, in the final row. And according to your total score, there are three categories. I just mentioned if the total score uh, is between 24 to 30, that means uh, you are at normal nutritional status. If the total score is between 17 and 23.5 points, you are at risk of malnutrition. If your uh, total score is less than seven points, that means you are at uh, malnourished. So there's uh, three categories. Right now, we do have another form uh, derived from original MNA form. We call MNA dash short form. That means only has a screening part. So only have six questions. But um, in the final question F, uh, either you can use your BMI or use your cuff circumference. So they will uh, modify uh, the scores. So uh, that's the MNA short form. Uh, especially for elderly, they only have the screening part, six questions. So that means six questions can determine whether or a screening, um, whether you do have uh, malnutrition or not. Okay, so those are uh, screening tool. So this, this is the, uh, I just mentioned that um, uh, the short form. So you can see the short form only has a screening part. So that's the MNA short form. Uh, abbreviate is MNA-SF. So next time, if you see the abbreviation MNA-SF, that means only has screening part, doesn't have assessment part. So you can see A, B, C, D, E, F. But for F, they have F1, question F1 and question F2. I just mentioned that question F1, um, if you do have your body weight and height data, you can calculate uh, your body mass index according to the formula. If you don't have your body weight uh, or your body weight cannot reflect your actual body weight, for example, if you have edema or severe dehydration, that means your body weight cannot uh, indicate your real body weight. 
you can use calf circumference, or you don't have a real uh, height data. Uh, usually, um, the elderly has something like has bent uh, vertebra, or we call bended uh, spine. So they can uh, stand up very strictly. So if you measure their height, if they do have the bent spine, there's not their real height. We call this a uh, bended uh, height, we call a uh, stature height. So if they cannot uh, you know, stand up very strictly, the height is not uh, reflect uh, directly uh, real height. So we won't use uh, this height to calculate BMI. So we don't have real body weight or real height data. How you can do? That means if you don't have the real body weight, real height data, you can calculate um, BMI. So instead of a calculation of BMI, you can use your cuff circumference. So they do modify the score for the cuff circumference. If you can see the total score for body mass index is zero to three. So they modify the cuff circumference. Uh, there's a two levels of scores, zero and three. So they modify original MNA uh, form for the cuff circumference only zero to one. They modify the score to zero three to adopt it uh, equals to the total score of uh, BMI. So it's easily to answer these six questions and you can have your total score. The same categories, uh, three categories, uh, one is normal nutritional status. The other one is the at risk of malnutrition. The third one is malnourished. So you have different scores uh, uh, corresponding to different status. So, uh, and also, they also develop what we call self MNA. What is self MNA? Self MNA, especially for the elderly, that means uh, this MNA form can be filled by the elderly themselves. So that means it's easy to read and easy to answer and easy to get the, the final results. So we can see this question now, uh, they have the bold size of the, uh, I mean, bold size of the word. So they uh, make the word uh, bolded and they also enlarge the font size so they can read very clearly. You can see this uh, questionnaire, they say, mini nutritional assessment for adults 65 years of age and older. So that means that's especially for the elderly. And they simplify the uh, basic information, only the name, date, and age. And they also, uh, simplify their questions. And you can see they have uh, the first page is uh, question A to question E. So the easy to uh, answer the question and easy to get the score zero to three so they can feel their scores and the empathy square. Then after you uh, answer uh, the question A to question E, you can uh, add the subtotal here. So you have the scores uh, for A to E. So you can see uh, they simplify the uh, self uh, MNA form to five questions. There's no measurement question, only A to E. So they have A to E uh, questions. This slides show another uh, question now, but it's a little bit difficult because it, you have to have your lab data. For example, you have to your lab data for l -wilming. There's another uh, types of the nutritional screening uh, tool. So they uh, have one point, two points, and three points. And they do have a different questions for uh, one, two, or three points. And after you fill the questions, uh, you can have the total Points, and they do divide it, uh, total points into three categories. So as, uh, 
there's uh, something like uh, no dietitian referral at this time. That means you are at good nutritional status. If the total points less than five points, if your points uh, is between five and six points, that means you have to go to a nurse or a dietitian, uh, have the con consultation and will uh, a professionals, especially for a dietitian, will make uh, recommendations for your lifestyle and uh, eating habits. If you have the scores at seven points, that means you request dietitian uh, consult by phone or by visit. So there's um, another tool for uh, nutritional screening, but it's a little bit different uh, tools because they combined with a uh, Questions, simple questions uh, for your diseases or for your, uh, you know, uh, uh, mood stage, and also your uh, bio lab, uh, biochemical data. For example, uh, albu uh, albumin data. So you have to know the albumin whether your albumin data is less than two point six gram per liter. Okay. The second part, I will uh, briefly introduce a different methods for nutritional assessment. So for the completed nutritional assessment include the following. So you can see, if you see uh, the order of the first alphabetical, uh, uh, the first letter will be A, B, C, D, E, F, and M, O. So first uh, A is uh, anthropometric measurement. B uh, stands for biochemical assessment. C stands for clinical assessment. D stands for diet. Assessment E stands for emotional uh, status, F uh, stands for uh, functional status, M that means mental status, or we say cognitive status. Finally, it's oral status. Usually, in the hospital in different countries, they might have different um, items for nutritional assessments. Usually, they will complete A, B, C, D. That means anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, and dietary. However, very, very few hospitals uh, in few countries, they will complete all the nutritional uh, assessments, include emotional, functional, mental, or oral. I don't know whether uh, you do have a nutritional assessment uh, in Indonesia hospital. I think usually we will complete uh, the first four. Uh, anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, and dietary. So I will go through all the assessment very quickly. Anthropometric assessment. So what this is anthropometric assessment? Includes uh, something like uh, body weight, weight change, height, relative weight for height, body mass index, circumference. There's a several circumference. I just mentioned mid-arm circumference uh, in the questionnaire. I mean, MNA questionnaire and calf circumference uh, in MNA questionnaire and skin folds. And final is um, your body compositions uh, measured by bioelectrical uh, impedance analysis. We call BIA analysis. So those are uh, what we call anthropometric um, assessments, but not all the anthropometric assessments uh, are suitable for the elderly, for example, body weight. So I just mentioned that sometimes we cannot uh, correctly or uh, accurately uh, calculate BMI because you cannot get your real body weight data because um, the elderly often has uh, the problem with the edema or severe dehydration. If the uh, person has edema, that means they uh, retain more water in their body. So they will increase their body weight because of the water. If the person has a severe dehydration, that means they do have the water loss from the body. So they will decrease their uh, body weight because they uh, have water loss. So if the person has either edema or severe dehydration can distort the actual body weight. That means they can now reflect uh, your real body weight. So, so um, the body weight is not good indicator for uh, nutritional status in the elderly. How about body weight change? If you remember uh, the questionnaire uh, for determining your nutritional health and uh, nutritional risk index, they also ask the question about whether you have weight gain or weight loss during the past three or uh, six months, um, if you have the weight gain or weight loss exceed 10 pounds. 
So 10 pounds, that means uh, it, it, they say, uh, they define 10 pounds as a kind of the greater changes for the body weight. So you have to notify why you do have the body weight change, uh, probably because of diseases. So, or nutritional status or change in your nutritional status. So weight change is better uh, than body weight as a nutritional uh, risk in indicator for the elderly. How about stature uh, or knee height? I just mentioned that if the elderly has the bent um, spine or bent uh, vertebra, that means uh, they cannot reflect their real height. We call this height is statural height. So statural height is not real height and also statural height will underestimate your real height because you uh, have, uh, you know, it, it, the height is uh, shorter, not taller than your real height. So therefore we can use another alternative way to uh, estimate your real height, so only estimate. So what kind of parameter we can estimate your real height? We can use knee height. That means uh, the height from your knee to your uh, feet. So we call this height, this distance is knee height. Knee height uh, is uh, proportionally, positively proportionally to your real height. So usually we can use the formula, uh, put uh, knee height as a parameter to calculate your real height. So we call this height is estimated height. So you can use your knee height to calculate estimated height. If you do have your estimated height, you, uh, you know your present body weight, then you can calculate your BMI. Relative, uh, relative weight for height, uh, the formula is a weight, your present weight divided by your uh, height. So if you do have the weight and height, real weight, real height data, you can use, uh, you can calculate relative weight for height. Also, you can calculate your uh, BMI. BMI um, is equal to weight in kilogram divided by height uh, in uh, square meter. Or you can measure your circumference, for example, mid arm circumference or calf circumference. How about waist or hip circumference? Waist or hip circumference usually um, can indirectly reflect your body fat. But uh, if you want to identify whether the elderly has um, malnutrition, not overnutrition, for example, not uh, obesity, you probably uh, do not use your waist circumference or your height, uh, sorry, heat circumference. You can use your meat arm circumference or calf circumference. If your meat arm circumference or calf circumference is uh, smaller, that's maybe indicates you will have, uh, you uh, will at high risk of uh, malnutrition. Skin folds. So we do have, uh, you can uh, measure the uh, tricep skin folds. However, tricep skin folds is not a good indicator for nutritional status because we change uh, the skin structure in the elderly. I will talk this later. B B I A uh, bioelectrical dependence analysis is a good uh, methods to uh, measure anthropometric assessment. Uh, that means they will uh, have more accurate uh, data for your body compositions. This graph show uh, uh, men's weight and uh, woman's weight. So you can see that you uh, use the percentile. So you can see the different curve indicate different uh, percentile uh, with the different ages in men and women. So you can use the uh, percentile according to your uh, age and see uh, whether you are uh, at a higher percentile or at a lower percentile. Body weight changes. Um, usually uh, we will have body weight change, uh, the clinical define body weight, definition for body weight changes. They do have um, something like certain degree decrease in certain period of time. For example, a loss of the one to 2% uh, of, or, of original body weight in a week or 
a loss of 5% of body original body weight in a month, or a loss of a 7.5% of original body weight in three months, or a loss of 10% of original body weight in six months. Those situations we call uh, body weight changes in clinical settings. And you also can see this graph shows in different days, especially for uh, Christmas or Christmas Eve or after the Christmas, you can see um, different time, you can have a different weight. So your body weight is kind of the fluctuated uh, in different days. And also uh, your body weight can be um, fluctuated in different months. So that is uh, different months, October to uh, next October and uh, the top graph is show uh, the main uh, body weight changes and the lower graph shows women's body weight changes. So you can see for both men and women, they do have body weight changes uh, with the different, in different uh, months uh, during a year. So you can see uh, we do have the body weight changes uh, in different seasons. And there's a strong correlation. Um, uh, BMI has, is, has a strong correlation with body fat in young adults. However, um, BMI probably is not a good indicator for nutritional status in the elderly because you can see the calculation of the body uh, BMI should have two parameters. One is body weight, the other is height. If you don't have um, uh, accurate, correct body weight or correct body uh, height uh, data, you won't calculate correct um, BMI. So sometimes uh, miscalculated estimates of uh, body fat in older adults uh, if you use the BMI. So uh, that's the following is the desirable BMI uh, for different ages. So we can see if increased ages uh, increase uh, the BMI, uh, desirable BMI values. For the elderly, greater than 65 years old, you can see the desirable BMI is equal to 24 to 29. In Taiwan, 24 to 29 uh, indicates uh, is overweight, or obesity, because we have overweight cutoff point is 24, uh, has obesity is 27 um, in Taiwan. So that's the in uh, United States. So you can see uh, they do have the desirable BMI uh, for a 60 years old or older is 24 to 29. Why increase age uh, will increase desirable BMI values? Why? Does anybody have the questions, want to ask the question? If you want to ask the question, please turn on your microphone. Anybody? Why increase age will increase desirable BMI values? Okay, sometimes we will think about uh, BMI, we, 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 how we define desirable BMI. Desirable BMI, that means if you have this BMI range, you are at good health. Uh, indirectly indicates you will decrease, uh, decrease the uh, disease risk. So uh, they think of uh, in the elderly, if they encounter uh, the diseases or severe diseases, for example, infected by uh, COVID-19 virus. If they do have more uh, body fat in, the, in their body, they probably have more um, re, re, uh, reserved uh, energy can be uh, derived from uh, fat degradation or uh, fat, uh, you know, uh, oxidation to generate energy. So that's the reason why they think um, increased age will increase desirable BMI value because they probably can, uh, you know, uh, 
if they do have a disease challenge, they can live longer or survive, uh, can, can survive if they do have a little bit uh, greater BMI value. However, uh, if you have the BMI value less than 24 or uh, greater than 27, that means you probably too, too thin or uh, overweight or uh, even obesity. So you, uh, you probably can uh, visit the dietitian or physician to have some intervention, dietary intervention or lifestyle intervention. This slide shows uh, different uh, categories for underweight, acceptable weight, marginal overweight, overweight, severe overweight, or morbid obesity. So there's a different uh, BMI ranges for either men or female. Okay, so uh, I just mentioned that the definition of a desirable BMI is related to this disease risk. If you see the tables, uh, BMI is between 20 and 25 in the case have very low uh, disease risk. If the BMI value is equal to or greater than 40, that means has ha very high disease risk. How about the BMI value less than 20? Do they have very, very low disease risk or they will increase their disease risk? The answer is uh, if the BMI less than 20, they think it will increase disease risk. So the shape, um, the curve of BMI and disease risk, just like a U shape. So that means if you decrease your BMI uh, too much, that you will also increase your disease risk. If you increase your BMI too much and increase your disease risk. So it's just like a U shape. Circumference, circumference, uh, Usually circumference can uh, indirectly uh, indicate two things, two body compositions. One is body fat, the other one is muscles. So if, we, uh, if you see uh, increased age will shift your body fat from extremity, that means from your hands, uh, uh, your arms, your, ha your arms and your legs, we call uh, extremities to your trunk. Trunk, that means central uh, trunk position, uh, for example, abdomen. So especially, uh, sorry, especially in female, and also will shift uh, fat from subcutaneous fat to deep adipose tissue. So from, you know, uh, surface to uh, the central part, and also shift uh, fat from peripheral to central. Um, Abdominal fat accumulation in men is greater than um, in women. So you can see usually uh, men has higher or larger waist circumference than female. And if you increase waist to hip ratio also increase disease risk. If the waist to hip ratio larger than 1.0 for men or uh, larger than point Eight for female, that means uh, increase uh, disease risk dramatically. A mid arm um, circumference, I just mentioned, is one of the indicator for malnutrition. And also, they can reflect um, both subcutaneous fat and muscle of arm. If uh, mid arm circumference less than 50 percentile or greater than 95 percentile, that is more likely to have a nutritional disorder or diseases. And uh, skin fold. Skin fold assessment is not a good uh, indicator for a nutritional status in the elderly. Why skin fold assessment is not a good indicator for the elderly? Because uh, redistribution of fat and also decreased elasticity of the skin. So it's very difficult to accurate uh, to uh, accurately measure skin fold. If you use a tricep skin fold, you have to identify uh, your subcut where is your sub subcutaneous fat because uh, decrease elasticity of the skin. So it's very difficult to identify the subcutaneous fat layer. So that means you probably have wrong 
uh, skin folds uh, data. So also it's marked alterations in skin thickness in the elderly. Uh, and also uh, atrophy of sub subcutaneous adiposity. For those uh, reasons, it's uh, not good. Uh, skin fold uh, assessment is not good indicator for nutritional assessment uh, in elderly. And if you use the skin fold uh, assessment, uh, the data is greater than 95 percentile or less than 50 percentile. That means you probably has obesity or underweight. You have to have uh, dietitian consult, uh, consultation. And also meet arms conference can uh, indirectly reflect or estimate muscle mass, especially uh, uh, use the uh, armed muscle mass. So you can use this formula. Meet arms conference in centimeter minus 3.14 multiplied by tricep skin fold in millimeter uh, in millimeter and all this is a square divided by 12.56, uh, then you can estimate your muscle mass. So if you do have this mid arms conference, you also can uh, estimate your muscle mass. Uh, finally, I introduce the final uh, methods for uh, anthropometric measurement. This is BIA, a bioelectrical uh, impedance analysis, abbreviated BIA. BIA is uh, reliable and um, relatively in in inexpensive, safety and highly uh, reproducible methods. And the measurement uh, time is only needs less than two minutes. So it's easy to use BIA to measure uh, body composition. So they will give you uh, body water and body fat and body muscles uh, data. And we also can calculate a body fat-free mass. Fat-free mass, that means contain only water and protein and minerals. So no fat, so we call body free, uh, body fat-free mass. So body fat-free mass can be calculated from body weight uh, minus weight of the body fat. Lean body mass is a different indicator uh, from uh, fat-free mass. Lean body mass in, uh, includes structural uh, lipids in cell membranes and nerves. So lean body mass calculation is body weight uh, minus fat from adipose tissue. If you compare the data uh, between uh, body fat-free mass and lean body mass, which one has a, a greater value, lean body mass or fat-free mass? The answer is uh, lean body mass because lean body mass still has lipids and those lipids located in the cell membranes and nerves. So if you compare, even we call lean body mass still still has a little bit lipids in the cell membranes and uh, nerves. But fat-free mass uh, indicates no fat at all. So that means fat-free mass uh, doesn't contain any fat. So fat-free mass is a little bit, the value of fat-free mass is a little bit uh, lower than uh, lean body mass because lean body mass still has a uh, certain um, fat. Okay. Biochemical assessment. Usually we don't do too many biochemical assessments for the elderly because they have to draw uh, their blood for a biochemical assessment. And sometimes because the structure of the skin um, uh, become thinner. So uh, it, sometimes it's diff and their vessel, blood vessel becomes fragile. So it's difficult to draw the blood from the elderly. So we have to minimize uh, the items you want to do the biochemical assessments for nutritional assessments. So usually we have to identify what kinds of problems um, the elderly might have. So we focus those uh, problems related to nutritional status. Then we um, determine which uh, biochemical parameters we need to know. 
So the elderly common in the elderly, the common problems are protein energy malnutrition or hypercholesterolemia, iron and folate deficiency anemia. So according to their common problems, we can determine what kind of uh, biochemical parameters uh, we can measure, especially for nutritional status. For protein energy malnutrition, we can measure protein status. There's a certain parameters, biochemical parameters can reflect or can indicate visceral protein status. That means the organ uh, protein status. What kind of uh, biochemical status uh, or what kind of uh, biochemical parameters can reflect visceral protein status? For example, serine albumin, serine pre-albumin and transferrin. And we will compare those three parameters later. And also we can use the number of the cells because uh, the major composition of the cells are protein. So we also can uh, measure the number of the cell to indicate uh, the protein status. For example, we can measure um, the number of the erythrocytes, the number of the granulocytes, this kind of the uh, white blood cells, and total lymphocyte count. So those uh, cell counts also indicate uh, protein status. What else? We can use uh, the protein in the body to reflect uh, protein status. For example, hemoglobin and serine cholesterol. You probably will doubt why serum cholesterol level can reflect, uh, can indicate protein status. Everybody knows uh, cholesterol is a kind of fat, right? And also we usually measure uh, serum cholesterol level. We expect if you have a high serum cholesterol level, you probably will have uh, the high risk for hypercholesterolemia. However, if you have a low, very low cholesterol, uh, cholesterol level, indicates you probably have protein energy malnutrition problem because you have very low uh, cholesterol level. So uh, the person with the protein energy malnutrition also often have um, very low serine cholesterol level. So that's the reason why we major serine cholesterol level can indicate uh, the protein status if the serum cholesterol level is very low, indicate you probably have uh, uh, your poor new, uh, protein status and probably uh, have high risk for a protein energy malnutrition. Cholesterol level, uh, we can reflect uh, hypercholesterolemia, whether uh, if the cholesterol level is very high, probably you will have high risk for hypercholesterolemia. Iron status will identify whether you do have the iron deficiency anemia. Folate status will identify whether you do have folate deficiency anemia. So according to these four uh, problems, protein energy malnutrition, hypercholesterolemia, iron deficiency anemia, uh, or uh, folate deficiency anemia, these four problems we can major uh, different biochemical parameters. Uh, first, I will just introduce the protein status. We just uh, mentioned there's a three uh, protein concentration we can uh, indicate um, for visceral protein status. Um, serine albumin, serine pre-albumin, and serine transferrin. Which one is better or which one can uh, more accurately reflect the visceral protein status? We can see the half-life. If their half-life is longer, for example, uh, albumin has the longest uh, half-life compared with the other two pro proteins. Uh, uh, albumin has two weeks to three weeks uh, half-life. However, pre-albumin has the shortest half-life, only two days. Which one can, uh, on time, directly reflect their protein status? If their half-life is shorter, can be more on time to reflect uh, can reflect the real time uh, protein status. If the half line is longer, can uh, uh, in immediately reflect your protein status. So is, if you compare those three, albumin, pre-albumin, transferrin, which one can um, real time reflect your protein status? This one, pre-albumin. However, pre-albumin is seldom um, majored in the hospital because uh, the, the cost 
of pre-albumin is much, much higher than albumin. So albumin is cheaper uh, to major albumin is cheaper than to major uh, pre-albumin. So that's the reason in the hospital, the usual, uh, usually often major albumin is state of management of pre-albumin. Even uh, though pre-albumin has a good, uh, is a good um, indicator for visceral protein status, but because it is uh, much, ex uh, much expensive. So in the hospital, uh, in the real world, we usually major albumin instead of a pre-albumin. Transferring is also an uh, um, iron status indicator and also is a good indicator for protein status. So we, um, I just I define the deficiency level so you can see different uh, uh, deficiency level in different parameters. The other is uh, uh, the cell count, for example, total lymphocyte count. Total lymphocyte count not only reflect the protein status, but also reflect um, uh, immune functions. So if you decrease the total uh, lymphocyte count or decrease protein status and also reduce your immune functions. Uh, if you have a severe malnutrition, you can see uh, the total lymphocyte count is less than 800 per uh, per millimeter uh, cubic, cubic millimeter. And decreased hemoglobin with increased age. So we have uh, the definition for uh, anemia uh, for men and uh, for male and female. Serum cholesterol level, if the uh, have low, very low serum cholesterol level, uh, for example, less than 160 milligram per deciliter of cholesterol. That means you probably have high risk for um, protein uh, malnutrition. Uh, for example, uh, protein energy malnutrition, and also increased risk of a uh, uh, hemo uh, hemorrhage stroke in the elderly. Hypercholesterolemia, that means total cholesterol level is greater than 200 milligram per deciliter. And also if you do have uh, those situation will increase uh, risk for coronary artery disease. If your cholesterol level is greater than 200 mini 240 milligram per deciliter, your LDL cholesterol level is greater than 160, triglyceride level is greater than 200 milligram per deciliter, or your HDL cholesterol level less than 40 milligram per deciliter for men and less than 50 milligram per deciliter for, uh, for women, or your uh, total cholesterol level uh, to HDL cholesterol level ratio larger than five, that means you have high risk for coronary artery diseases. So those, for those uh, with the high risk for coronary artery diseases, we have the target goals. That means you have to decrease your total cholesterol level to lower level, uh, for example, uh, lower than uh, 160 milligram per deciliter if you are at high risk for coronary heart diseases. Okay, iron deficiency anemia. Um, there's a three stages for iron deficiency. So the first stage is iron depletion. Uh, the second stage is iron deficient uh, erythropoiesis. And the third stage you have uh, developed the uh, diseases, anemia. So this type of anemia is microcytic hypochromic uh, anemia. What is microcytic? Microcytic, that means decrease the size of the erythrocyte. So you can see, um, the size of the erythrocytes is decreased. Hypochromic, that means they have low uh, hemoglobin levels. So you can see uh, decreased hemoglobin uh, in uh, red blood cells and decreased mean uh, cospicular uh, volume. That means decrease, decrease the size of the um, hemoglobin, uh, de decrease the size of the RBC and also decrease uh, hematocrit. So that's what we call microcytic hypochronic anemia. So they, they have the three stages. The first stage is uh, only uh, a little bit decrease in uh, our own storage, storage protein we call uh, ferritin. But for the second stage, as you can see, the ferritin level is uh, pretty low, is uh, probably uh, equals to uh, 10 microgram per deciliter. But for diseases, is you can see the iron store, uh, storage um, protein ferritin is very, very low, it's less than 10. Why will uh, 
why will cause the uh, folate deficiency anemia in the elderly? Usually they will decrease um, uh, dietary folate intake. Why the elderly decrease dietary folate intake? If you uh, think about what kind of food rich in folate? What kind of foods are rich in folate? For example, the uh, green leafy vegetables, because uh, some of the uh, vegetable rich in folate and vegetable contain a lot of the dietary fibers as well. So those foods rich in folate also rich in dietary fibers. So the texture of the food is kind of hard uh, for the elderly. So they probably don't uh, like to choose the foods, uh, for example, uh, vegetables. So they will also decrease dietary folate intake. And, and they, are, they change um, physiological functions in elderly. Uh, they will decrease absorption of the folate. So they have something like malabsorption syndrome. And if they do have the prescribed, several prescribed drugs, uh, for example, chronic aspirin use for uh, cardiovascular diseases, they also will interfere with the folate uh, status or they have uh, chronic uh, alcohol uh, intake. They also will uh, increase folate excretion from the body. So those reasons is easy to cause, uh, we call folate deficiency anemia. And the, also there's a three stages, just like iron deficiency. Usually we will uh, measure two different types of uh, uh, two different uh, measurements for folate status. One would measure serum folate. The other one would measure uh, erythrocyte folate. That means folate status in RBC, red blood cells. So which one, serum folate or erythrocyte folate can uh, uh, be the better indicator for folate status? The answer is erythrocyte folate. If you do remember, uh, when we talk about the iron deficiency anemia, we will use the ferritin level as, uh, as a, a cutoff point for uh, anemia and also for different stages of the iron deficiency uh, status. So because the ferritin is a kind of the iron storage form, then uh, folate, storage in uh, RBC, so erythrocytes. So usually erythrocyte folate level indicates body stores and more uh, as, as, as better indicator for nutritional status of folate. So if you do choose um, which one can reflect uh, nutritional uh, folate status, serum folate or uh, erythrocyte folate, you can choose erythrocyte folate because it can directly reflect uh, body stores in, of the folate in your body. And erythrocyte folate compared with the serum folate is like a more reliable index of folate status. And folate status also has three um, stages to develop the uh, folate deficiency anemia, just like uh, iron deficiency anemia. This table shows uh, different levels of uh, different parameters. So you can see high level deficiency level or depletion levels uh, for different parameters. So you can see the clinical uh, references data. The clinical assessment uh, usually uh, provided by the physicians. But I just mentioned that sometimes uh, in different population, even they do have a, uh, the same uh, symptom probably uh, will be diagnosed as a different disease or different uh, or different situation, diagnosed as a different situation. For example, if the elderly has a uh, night blindness, we probably think about not uh, because of uh, vitamin A deficiency, is because of a, a cataract. So, so if uh, the elderly has night blindness, we will probably uh, think about because of cataract not vitamin A deficiency. But for some of the uh, population, not the elderly, we probably will think about both, uh, whether they do have the possibility for uh, cataract or uh, have the possibility for vitamin A deficiency. Functional status uh, is uh, not the physical function uh, measurements. Uh, usually functional status just unlike uh, living uh, functions. 
So the factors determine whether you do have the ability to, uh, to prepare the food and also to cook the food and to feed uh, yourself. So we call those uh, factors, we call functional status, not rather than physiological functions. Cognitive uh, status usually uh, uh, is measured or determined by um, psychiatric uh, physicians. Oral health is determined by uh, the dentist. And also we, sometimes if you use uh, some of the drugs will also interfere with your nutritional status. Dietary assessment. Dietary assessment is very important for uh, nutritional assessment. And also, uh, usually dietary assessments is uh, measured by uh, dietitians. So there's a several way to have a dietary assessment. For example, the prospective methods, retrospective methods, or food frequency questionnaires. So if you consider prospective retrospective uh, methods or food frequency questionnaire, which one is suitable for the elderly? Do you have an answer? Which one is suitable for the elderly? Prospective methods, retrospective methods, or food frequency questionnaires? Mungkin ada yang mau jawab itu pertanyaan ketiga dari Prof. Jin loh. Tadi nggak ada yang mau jawab loh. Mana yang lebih cocok untuk uh, lansia, prospektif, retrospektif, atau yang food frequency questionnaire? Uh, maybe food frequency questionnaire. Frequency questionnaires. Wow. What else? Is any other answers? Yang okay. lainnya? Okay, the answer is not all, the, not, not anyone all. is suitable for the elderly. Why? I will tell you the reasons. Okay, prospective method. What kind of the, uh, method we call prospective method? That means you will have to something like uh, uh, write the food diary or uh, record your food or uh, you eat right now or in the following meals. However, because the elderly has poor memory, so they cannot memorize uh, to record or uh, to write down what kind of food and how much portion size they eat. So that's the problem because the memory, poor memory. The same problem with the retrospective and more difficult because retro, we call retrospective, that means you have to memorize the day before you eat. So for example, today you will memorize yesterday, how much you eat, what kind of food you eat. So, so it's very difficult. Even for us, you probably will, uh, don't memorize all the foods, all the proportion size you eat. So. What is the uh, retrospective methods for uh, dietary assessment? We can use 24 uh, dietary recall or a serial 24 hour record. That means more than one day. So even uh, for one day, you cannot memorize the yesterday's um, dietary intake. You cannot memorize three days ago, right? So that's the, uh, the difficulty for maybe for us and for uh, all the uh, elderly because of their poor memory. How about food frequency, uh, food frequency questionnaires? Food frequency questionnaires also have many items. So they have uh, the food items and also have the frequency answers. So you have to choose what kind of uh, uh, options you want to choose for each food items. So the questionnaires will ask how often you eat. So we'll think about in terms of uh, per day, per week, even per month. So you have to think about um, this food item, how often you eat. It's also challenge their memory. 
usually food frequency questionnaire will ask your uh, eating habit for the past month or past three months or past six months. So you can see the uh, description uh, on the top of the food frequency questionnaires, how you can answer the questions. And they have the uh, description about uh, if you think about your uh, eating behavior or eating habits uh, during uh, in the past month or in the past three months or six months. So in the past period of time, uh, you will think about, uh, you will memorize all the food items they ask in the few frequency questionnaires, how often you eat. So very difficult for their memory. So that's the uh, problems for the elderly, even for prospective, retrospective, the food frequency questionnaires, all the methods needs memory, okay? To do or to memorize, okay? So that's, uh, if you don't have any um, doctor assessment is suitable for the elderly, how we can have alternative way to do the dietary assessment, especially for the elderly. If you think that all the methods are not uh, accurate enough. If you think, so if you want to have more accurate, more uh, correct um, answer for, or assessment for dietary assessment, uh, we need someone help the elderly to uh, do 24 hour record or uh, to do a uh, food questionnaire, a uh, food frequency questionnaire, usually the uh, caregivers for uh, the old people. So the caregiver is very important person to uh, deliver the message, especially for a dietary assessment. So usually when you do the dietary assessment, especially for the elderly, you did not directly face to the elderly because they cannot memorize the question you ask. So um, the important thing is you have to ask the questions or request caregiver to give you the answer. That's the reason you can, that's the, the way uh, you, can uh, you, can, you can solve the problems of the poor memory. How about visual come stock, professor? How about nutritional? No, visual com stock method for Please. elderly. Yeah. Uh, visual com stock to see Physical. the ways. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's the, the the way you can you can do. But you have to uh record uh the foods of before they eat and yeah. after they eat, and someone should be uh weigh the waste. Yes, you waste. Okay. Like, oh. Yeah. So. Uh, the same the same problem is the elderly cannot memorize to do uh, any record before they eat and after they eat or to weigh the waste. But someone have to do this for them, caregiver. Okay, caregiver. So caregiver is the key person to, uh, you know, if you want to complete a doctor assessment for the elderly. Okay, doctor history. Is also one of the methods for dietary assessment. So dietary uh, history will ask the question about the dietary habits. So we'll uh, identify uh, uh, a typical day eating habits or occasional or alternative uh, eating habits and during uh, the weekdays or during a uh, weekend. And also we can use uh, uh, the plate different sides of the plate to uh, give them the information the, uh, about the uh, portion size. So there's a uh, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, size of the plate and they have something like fork and no um, the length and the size. And also we can do a three day weight uh, or major to uh, record, but it's also difficult for the elderly to uh, remember to do this. So caregiver can do this, but you have to have uh, uh, the scale to weigh uh, the food, okay? So that's a uh, doctor assessment. Other assessment, I just talk about functional status. It's not physiological function. 
it's a kind of activities of daily living. So that's a function of your daily life. What kind of functions? Uh, feeding functions, food preparation functions, uh, shopping or mode of transportation. If you do have a difficulty to uh, shop uh, in the supermarket or you do have uh, the difficulty to prepare the food by yourself or you do have a difficulty to feed uh, the food uh, by yourself, you have to have someone to help you to prepare the food, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, buy the food, to prepare the food and to uh, feed the food to you. So that's what we call a uh, functional status. So the uh, social workers can do um, the functional status uh, assessment. And oral status, that means uh, usually determined by the dentist will evaluate the dental caries, whether you do have the dental caries or other inflammations in oral uh, teeth or uh, uh, other problems, or oral aging or even uh, oral cancers. Uh, which is evaluated by dentists. Mental or cognitive status. That means we'll use the questionnaire uh, to identify whether you do have the dementia or other impairment, cognitive impairment um, or memory impairment. So we can use the questionnaires or use the image uh, of your brain to identify whether you do have mental or cognitive uh, problems. And uh, if you do have mental or cognitive problems, also indirectly or directly affects your oral intake or your, or your nutritional status. The final part I will uh, briefly introduce is establishment of a nutritional assessment tool. So we just uh, mentioned several nutritional uh, screening tool already established uh, in the world. But the very important is you have to do the screening uh, evaluation and make the nutrition care plan. So in the beginning, you have to screen, evaluation, and plans. And uh, after the plans, you have to re-evaluation the, uh, whether they uh, improve their nutritional status or not. So that's the, uh, the cartoon say, uh, this, uh, the elderly say, uh, this is a, a nutrition care plan for, for her. I'm sorry. Okay. When we uh, develop the new nutritional assessment tool, we have to consider uh, two things. Is, uh, whether it's reliable or not, whether it's valid or not. So usually we will consider both uh, categories, uh, reliability and valid, uh, validity. So what, what is the reliability and validity? If you see this, um, they do have uh, different spots on this uh, surface. If the different spots um, is very uh, narrow range, we call reliable, but not valid because the center is in the red spot. It's not near the center, but uh, they're, ver they're very close together. Okay, so we we'll, we'll call reliable, but not valid. This one is, you can see uh, some of the uh, spots near the center and some of the spots uh, just uh, spread out. So we call this valid, but not reliable. Uh, and this one is we'll call not uh, spread all of the, the place but uh, only sprayed uh, on the top uh, surface and some of the uh, spots near the center we call neither a reliable nor valid. If all the spots near the center and all the spots is very narrow and close together, we call both uh, reliable and valid. So we want all the data near the, uh, the central tendency and the range of a variation of the data as small. So we call reliable and valid. So there's a, a different uh, reliability test to test, to determine whether uh, it's reliable or not. And you can see uh, if you use a different test, they have a different uh, numbers or different data. 
and we also classified into different uh, categories. Uh, if we can accept this range, we'll call re reliable. If we cannot accept this uh, range, we'll, we'll call not reliable. So there's a different ways. So we can we can test a uh, uh, homogeneity uh, or a stability or a, a equivalency. Uh, so there's a different uh, statistical methods to test uh, different um, different categories. So uh, Chrome best alpha that value or test retest reliability uh, or other inter reliability test. So if you get the data and there's a, a, a septal range. So within a septal range, that means reliable. But it's uh, not in the uh, a septal range we call not reliable. So there's a, a different uh, reliable test we can we can uh, we can do. And validity. Also, we have validity test. Uh, so there's a uh, there's a different domains of validity. So that we have false negative or true negative, and true positive and false positive. So you can see this. Uh, uh, we can uh, calculate. So uh, we call sensitivity and specificity. Both are uh, indicators for validity. So we will have high sensitivity, high specificity. We call we have a good validity. So there's a, a, a sensitivity calculation, specificity calculation, and accuracy uh, calculation based on these four parameters, false negative, true negative, uh, true positive or false positives. Okay, so you can see uh, validity. We, we will have high, both high, high sensitivity and high specificity. So when, when you develop a, a new nutritional tool, uh, we will uh, draw our ROC curve. What is the ROC receiver operating characteristic curve? A preface ROC. So we can have uh, X uh, axis is one minus specificity. Y axis is sensitivity. So we will have uh, uh, this line. And if, if you see the curve, green, red, and black curve is above this line. That means they will have high sensitivity. So usually we will um, both consider true positive rate, that means sensitivity, and false positive rate. So we will consider uh, true will be high sensitivity, but we don't want false positive rate high. So we want false positive rate is acceptable, but not high. So usually we uh, expect all the curves should be on the uh, upper left side, okay? So you can see the uh, accuracy uh, for different line is 0 0.89, 0 0.83, 0 0.78. So in the gate, one is better right now. And we do have uh, different um, validity uh, categories. So there's a good validity, fail a a validity, and poor validity. So both consider sensitivity and specificity. If both are high, more than 80%, we say good validity. If uh, only uh, one of the uh, parameters, sensitivity or specificity is high, um, or both uh, above, 50% we call fail validity. If uh, sensitivity or specificity less than 50% we call poor validity. So if you want to develop the um, tool, we expect you will have the good validity. That means both sensitivity and specificity should be higher than 80%. For example, we just talk about uh, different um, worldwide uh, common used uh, 
nutritional assessment for the elderly. For example, uh, mini nutritional assessment short form. So you can see uh, they do uh, this short form in different places in community. So uh, or in the institution, for example, the nursing home institution. If they do have a different uh, target in different places, they will get a different sensitivity and the specificity. But um, you can see for the short form, uh, the sensitivity in community is 74%. In institution, nursing home is 64%. Specificity in community is 95%. For an institution, that's nursing home is 100% specificity. So you can see uh, MNA short form is, uh, uh, I would say is a good um, validity. It's a, has a good validity. Okay, uh, there's also compare different, uh, different uh, assessment. So that's a short form only use the BMI question, short form use the circumference, that's the num uh, question F. If they use um, uh, in different, uh, th that's the high risk malnutrition, that's, this already malnutrition, so they can, uh, See, you can see um, the sensitivity and specificity in different area, rural and uh, urban and rural areas, but both are high, very high. So that means uh, the validity is good for uh, MNA, short form MNA. Okay, finally, uh, we can use the nutritional tools to screen uh, nutritional status or use uh, anthropometric biochemical methods, uh, clinical methods, or uh, dietary assessment to uh, determine, evaluate the nutritional status. But also we can use the physical size of malnutrition in elderly. So you can see if, if in the face, if they have the hollowed uh, on the eyes, that means uh, they probably have not good uh, nutritional status or uh, you know, something like uh, if they do have uh, lost appetites or a uh, thinner, lower uh, uh, cough or uh, you know, loss of weight. So you can see the physical signs of malnutrition in the elderly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Jin. Um... This is question, this is a very interesting point. And I have question from our student from Levia. She wants to ask you how to choose the right screening tools for healthy or uh, this is elderly. Okay, for healthy elderly, I, I think um, we can choose the uh, screening tool has uh, uh, less questions. So I will say I just introduced uh, some of the uh, questionnaires and some of the formula. But for me, I think MNA short form is good because it only has six questions. And uh, if for the cell, uh, if, if the elderly can, uh, for the healthy elderly, they probably can fill in the question by themselves. So they can use the self MNA, only five questions. Don't have any measurement. For that, uh, the, uh, the patients, uh, I mean, for the elderly patients with the diseases, I would suggest that um, you can either use uh, MNA short form uh, or I think that that one is good enough because um, uh, someone can feel the question for them and major, you know, cough conference or BMI. Yeah. So, so that's the reason why um, an A short form is very, very popular in the world. Uh, not only because they do have a different languages. I think, I believe uh, they also translate into Indonesia, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so that, that's the reason they translate it into different languages. So that's the reason why they can uh, popularly, uh, commonly use uh, uh, worldwide. And also the question now is, is short and easy to answer, mm -hmm. uh, easy to have the uh, total score, uh, easy to 
identify whether they do have um, a high risk or a risk or malnutrition already. Yeah. So self uh, MNA can uh, used for suggest for healthy uh, elderly. MNA short form is suggested to um, uh, the patients with the diseases. MNA short. Yeah. Yeah, next question from Askanisa. Uh, why, need we, why we need albumin data, not other? I think biochemical data, you have to neither, not only albumin. Not only albumin, but if you see the questionnaire, uh, some of the questionnaire, uh, for example, GNRI. GNRI is the formula used uh, albumin as a parameter because uh, even though albumin is not the best indicator for protein status. However, it's the most common measurement in the hospital. So uh, if you don't get the data, you cannot uh, uh, you know, calculate GNRI or other questionnaire need uh, albumin data. So why they use uh, albumin? Because the albumin is the often uh, to be tested uh, in the hospital. So you can easily uh, get the albumin data, but not easily get a uh, pre-albumin data. Yeah, Even pre-albumin is uh, the best. Expensive. Uh, yeah, right, expensive. That's the reason. Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome for Miss Titin from <laughs> ICAR and Miss Yanesti. Maybe you can ask for <laughs> Professor Jane. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Professor Jen. Thank you, Nathan. Hi. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Zao'an. 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 <laughs> yeah, she is my uh, senior lecturer. Uh, um, yeah, thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was studying in uh, Wenghua Dashi. You are studying? In Wenghua Dashi, Yang Ming San. Yang Ming San. Oh, you, you, you are right now in Yang Ming San? No, no, I'm, I'm in Indonesia, in Sumarang. Oh, Indonesia, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was graduate in there. So okay. it's very interesting topic about the malnutrition for elderly. Actually, yeah. like in Indonesia, uh, we know not so many people care about the elderly because yes. I'm in sports science, so I'm not too much know about nutrition, but we know um, elderly, um, how to say then they usually they are more thin and it's like a day direction yes. um, call sarcopenia. 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 sarcopenia sarcopenia yeah because they lost of the uh, protein from their muscles yeah yes there's also the, the big problem in taiwan right now yeah and day direction also usually yes. they're day direction. so how how you can make some like a uh, Water, water, or something. They must drink to how to say to assumption them not to hydrate so much. Okay, for dietary suggestion uh, for those people with the uh, sarcopenia, mm -hmm. I would say they will uh, intake more high quality proteins. Even they their uh, muscle synthesis is not as good as uh, young generation. However, if they lack of a protein. It's lack of uh, uh, muscle synthesis. So I think uh, high quality protein that means easy to digest, easy to absorb. So uh, I suggest that probably um, uh, plant source um, proteins is one of the good uh, protein. Animal protein, even uh, it's um, high quality, but sometimes uh, will cause, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sometimes it will cause the food allergy because the protein, uh, animal proteins. So I would suggest if you want to choose the high uh, quality protein, you can choose the uh, plant proteins uh, rather than animal proteins. And also milk, dairy products, also uh, the, the good protein sources. And uh, except for the protein, if they consume uh, foods uh, in smaller uh, portion size, I will also encourage them probably can, can have the dietary uh, supplement. 
for example, you have the multiple uh, vitamin supplements or uh, mineral supplements that were also good for um, the elderly. So uh, if they consume the foods uh, with the smaller portions. So the, the reason why they do have uh, sarcopenia, uh, either uh, the dietary intake is small or less, or they do have something like, uh, you know, loss of the protein uh, because the increase of age, the, because increased age. So that's the um, normal aging process where loss of the proteins from um, uh, the muscles. So another is a very important thing is um, exercise. So not only, you know, uh, to have a uh, high quality protein uh, consumption and have the dietary supplements with the uh, multivitamins and minerals, but also uh, we encourage the elderly uh, can have regularly exercise, but they can choose the exercise uh, suitable for them. Not, not too heavy exercise, okay, but uh, they can have the regularly exercise. Uh, every week or every day. I will, I think it's good for them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Again. Thank you. 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 Universitas Negeri Medan. No question. Uh, okay, from Irisa. Is sarcopenia just happen in elderly or also can happen in child, teen, or adult? Okay, I would say uh, sarcopenia is frequently uh, occurs uh, in the elderly, but not only occur in the elderly. Some people probably in the early age can have a uh, sarcopenia. Uh, sarcopenia, that means you have something like um, increased uh, protein loss from the muscles. So um, some diseases were related to what we call muscle wasting. So they will have something like uh, unexpected reason <laughs> to have a loss of the proteins from the muscles, okay, will cause sarcopenia. But not often uh, occurs in you know, uh, young ages, but um, will, will happen, but not, not very often. Okay. Okay. Another question. Uh, Professor Jen, what is the difference about condition health in elderly before pandemic and in pandemic era in Taiwan? There are significant condition for elderly or maybe? You mean, uh, can, can you say again? Sorry, question, your questions. Uh, what is the difference about a condition of healthy in elderly before pandemic and in era pandemic in Taiwan. It's a significant uh, okay. difference or? Uh, you mean uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Yep. I think um, be, 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 because uh, COVID-19 pandemic, so uh, people not often to eat outside because uh, so, uh, so you can see some of the restaurants uh, they do not have uh, many people to um, go to the restaurant. However, because the, uh, we control uh, COVID-19 fashion very well, so right now you still can uh, you know, see very common, uh, uh, they will eat uh, outside. Uh, for the first beginning of the COVID-19, they probably eat, uh, uh, prepare the food uh, by themselves. But right now we do have something like meaning uh, we will increase the business of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, we call um, uh, lunchbox sending, uh, sending business. 
So oh. we have something like a uh, uh, Food Panda or Uber Eat. Okay, <laughs> to uh, they have yeah they have so many um uh so many uh people just uh just make a phone call mm -hmm. and to uh order uh their food. So they uh, somebody will send the food uh uh just to your home. Yeah. Outside the door, so they can put the uh your uh your food outside the door, so you, you can pick up the the food. So they, they won't see each other. Okay, that's a good, good way. But also uh, you increase their business because uh, um, people don't want to eat outside. So they will just uh, order the phone, uh, order the food by phone. And uh, so they can send the food, uh, we, we don't see each other. So right now, I think the nutritional status doesn't change a lot, but the eating habit changes. Yeah. Because they uh, they eat at home, but the food preparation is by the restaurant, not by themselves. So they just order the food. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Maybe in the last You're question welcome. before we maybe last question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, best wishes to all your health and all your uh, study and career. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we can take a picture. You okay. can, uh, yeah, your video, please. Yeah, big smile. I just want one, two, three. Oh, is oh, from Lafia. He just maybe I think say. Mm. Okay, next. <laughs> next. One, two, three. Sorry, Professor. Uh, I think yes. I have one question from our students. Sure. Last question. Sure. What is, oh, yeah. To serve food to the elderly, we need nutrition, uh, nutrition food to avoid all diseases. Um, what is the solution? On the other hand, the elderly need nutrition food to maintain their nutritional status but they didn't have ability to taste because as we know the elderly uh, they have a decrease on taste in another food or everything yeah yeah usually it's very uh difficult to prepare the foods for the elderly because they uh sometimes they decrease uh uh the taste uh, or smell uh, or swallowing or uh, biting ability. So usually we prepare the food, um, you know, with a smaller size and uh, the texture is soft. And also the tasty, uh, usually the taste uh, for uh, salty or for sweet is will be lost in the elderly. So they taste the foods not sweet enough, not salty enough. But when we add more uh, sugar or more salt, we're not healthy. So I think uh, uh, we can only change the uh, texture or that them, uh, you know, easy to bite, easy to swallow. But uh, the 
I think the tasty of the food, you can use something like uh, more uh, bright color to uh, think uh, that's your eyes or vision to see the foods more delicious, but not taste the foods more delicious <laughs> because you uh, will, you know, you can uh, taste very uh, sharply because you lost of the taste buds functions. So you can okay. use a different colors or uh, different textures, some more soft and smaller size, smaller portion. Yeah, easy to swallow and bite in. Okay, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. <laughs> well, because the time is over, finally, uh, I would like to thank you again for Professor Jin Chow, PhD from Taipei Medical University. And sure enough, to students for your active participation and for Miss Sri Sumatiningsi, Butitin, Miss Yanesti Nur Afiada, Bufinda, and Miss Dina Budina from Taiwan. Um, hopefully, this will show a lecture beneficially for everybody. Uh, certificate will deliver to your email. And before this, you can fill the link that I share in chat menu. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Professor Jen. Thank you. Uh, Thank good you. morning. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your listening and best wishes to you all. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Yeah. You have greeting for, from my dean, Professor Tanjora Hayu. She says sorry because he can join with us because he have, uh, she has another agenda. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I will leave. Thank you for all. I will be off the line. Yeah. Okay. okay. Be healthy. See you. Bro. See you. Terima kasih. Jangan lupa untuk isi sertif link sertifikatnya untuk nanti dapat apa supaya nanti bisa diakses untuk sertifikatnya ya. Oke, ada yang mau ditanyakan belum saya akhiri? No? Oke, thank you. Saya endkan ya.